Greetings all, this is Nick from Those Hairy Gamers, and we're back to talk about a bit more X-Wing content today. Uh, it's a week on from the Star Viper Mark II article, and sadly we did not get our Kirax Vaxi article today. Nevertheless, I'm sure we'll see it within the coming weeks, given the current schedule we have. We're about three weeks out from Gen Con, which I would... Be very surprised if FFG didn't announce Wave 12 during that. Um, perhaps they're going to have some advanced copies of high guns there, uh, which means, I guess, in about a week's time, that spaces it out nicely to get the articles out. Indeed, they haven't really been doing that whole one article every week kind of pattern they used to, so I can understand it, but I'm still a bit disappointed. I really wanted to see it. So instead today, we're going to have a look at another upgrade card. I wanted to take a closer look at the cruise missile. Um, in the reveal video I did for the Wave 11 spoilers that came out about a week before the actual wave itself, I spoke about this and I said, I actually said, I think this is trash. And in hindsight, I think I was a bit unfair. Indeed, I don't really want this channel to be centered around that kind of negativity. I want to try and give everything a fair go. I don't mind saying that there are trash upgrades in X-Wing. There absolutely are trash upgrades and pilot cards in X-Wing. Uh, but that's okay. I think in general, they're getting better and better at making these upgrades and indeed giving us more flavors and different ways to play the game. And I think that's what we were going with the cruise missile. The main reason I said, look, I don't think this card's any good is because it doesn't really function like a missile that I like to use. It doesn't really function like a good basic alpha striking missile. It's different. It's forcing us to fly and think with different strategies. And that's actually a really good thing. So rather than just crapping all over it and saying, this is rubbish, don't ever play it, we're gonna take a look at it in context of the other missiles and actually have a think about the best way to use it and sort of do a little comparison here. Right, up here on the screen now is the entire gamut of missiles you can take, uh, ranging lowest to highest cost. And as you can see, the cruise missile sits right in the middle. It is the exact same cost as proton rockets and the ion pulse missile. Now, I like all of these missiles up to this point. The cruise missile is the only one I'm not so sure about, but I think... Uh, Given the options we have in X-Wing, these all have their place. They all justify what they do for their squad point cost. When we're comparing the cruise missile to these, we have to think about how it functions. And right off the bat, looking at the first three missiles on this list, they don't really function the same as the cruise missile. The cruise missile is designed to be your standard this is a big attack, lots of attack dice, lots of hit results. That's the way this card functions. And it doesn't really function the same way as the XX-23 S-Red Tracers, the Advanced Homing Missiles, or the Iron Pulse Missile. All of those, um, uh, when it hits, do something weird. You don't get to have all these hit results. You give them a face-up damage card or a point of damage and two ion, blah, blah, blah. They don't function like what I'd call quote-unquote standard missiles. So in terms of how I want to look at this, I want to compare it to the rest of these, uh, barring the assault missile, which again is on the other end of the spectrum, but pretty much does the same thing. Basically, the design with the cruise missile, the proton rockets, the cluster missiles, the concussion missiles, and the homing missiles, they're all meant to be just big one-off attacks that do a lot of damage, give you lots of red dice, give you lots of hit results, and pumps in a lot of damage into your opponent. Um, so from that point of view, let's take a look at the one card that sits on the same squad point value, the Proton Rockets. Uh, basically, those work in a similar kind of fashion to the cruise missile. You're sort of limited with the kind of flying you have to do to get them off, but you're not limited to the kind of maneuvers you can do, which is my main criticism of the cruise missile. You have to be in range one, and obviously they're designed for ships with high agility, so A-wings, TIE Advanced prototypes, TIE Advanced, those kinds of ships with the rocket slot. Uh, indeed, it's pictured with an A-wing, and personally, I think the A-wing is the best ship to put this with. There are a couple of of really good generic A-Wing pilots, Pilot Skill 1 or Pilot Skill 3 with an APT, and it really works strongly with those ships. Sure, it's hard to pull off a range one shot, but when you have multiples, or you even don't worry about making it an imperative to get it done during the game, but you always have the risk that if your opponent flies into range one, they might be taking this big shot. It certainly works quite well. Obviously, you invest three points in a missile. You want to get it off every game, but if you can massively change the way your opponent flies to avoid it, um, it sort of has its value as well. Three points is 
a bit pricey for something that functions that way, but Proton Rockets, I think, at least is nice and consistent. With Cruise Missile, though, I think it has that same kind of issue, but in my opinion, is a bit more risky. Um, as I said before in the previous video where I talked about this, it really limits the way you have to fly. Indeed, it telegraphs the way you have to fly. Um, the best way to get value out of this is to do a four straight, which is good because then you get a five dice tack that doesn't spend your target lock, so you get re-rolls, but your opponent's going to know exactly where you want to fly. Um, and the backup solution to this is, of course, doing a three speed where you can go the hard turns, the banks, or the straight, um, which is good. You still get a four dice attack with re-rolls. It kind of loses a bit of value if you do that, but you do have that option. And I guess you can play those kinds of mind games. My biggest issue is you're telegraphing where you fly. That, that's the biggest thing. Um, with missiles, if you invest one more point, you have access to either the cluster missiles or the concussion missiles. And those missiles, in my opinion, function way more consistently than something that has that's something that forces you to fly a certain way. The concussion missile in particular is one of my favorites. Uh, you can put it on a ship with guidance chips. You have a real good chance of getting the full value out of that card. A uh, concussion missile paired with guidance ships basically is a very, very high odd chance of getting four hits. And if you pair it with something that increases the amount of attack dice you have, it's very easy to get five hits, uh, like a Indru Salak or something like that. It works great with concussion missile, in my opinion. Cluster missile, again, it's very nice and consistent. You don't get um, modifications to your dice for free like the concussion missile. But again, anything that boosts your attack, you get the double effect, like Andrew Sarak um, suddenly gets two four attack dice. If you pair it with fearlessness and get that range one shot, you get two three attack dice with two free hits on top, which is amazing with this card. There's a lot of nice consistency out of that. Indeed, if you spend one more point, you get the homing missiles, which is the most consistent attack in the game. Four dice, you get the re-rolls, and your opponent cannot spend the evade token. That is fantastic. Sure, it doesn't attack with five dice like the cruise missile possibly can, However, the great thing about that is it's good against aces. It's really powerful against like Sunterfell and that kind of thing. You can often get four hits off the homing missiles and if certain ships rely on their evade token, it's fantastic. So from that point of view, the cruise missile definitely is in the right place being cheaper, but sometimes I feel like it's not cheaper enough. Having said that, it's important to note that it is cheaper because that gives it an advantage over these other cards. Ordnance is often a difficult thing to play with because if you don't get your ordnance off during a game, you've wasted those points. Uh, I know three points as opposed to four or five points doesn't seem like a big deal, but in my eyes with ordnance, it really is. So if you can find a good way to leverage those points, it works quite well. Indeed, if we're thinking about ships like, I don't know, Vader, the Inquisitor, TIE Defenders, stuff like that can, that can take these missile upgrades, they certainly don't want to look at investing four or five points because that makes them too expensive. If you've got a three ship build, um, you don't want to have ordnance because it really throws out the amount of points you can spend between them and it really throws out the balance of your entire list. Having a three point missile might just address that. Um, I've been having some discussions with some guys about is it worth putting this on a TIE Defender in lieu of the titles? Uh, the TIE-D does not work with missiles and the TIE-X7 gets rid of the missile upgrade slot and um, my reaction is probably not because it costs three points as, a, as opposed to zero or negative two, but it's not the worst option in the world. Doing a 4K then throwing out a five dice missile could be pretty amazing. Um, yeah, even, even with that concept, I'm on the fence. But I think the real silver lining with this is the fact that it costs less than missiles which pretty much do the same thing. The odds of it hitting are slightly less than those more expensive missiles, but not significantly so. A cruise missile, if fired after a four-speed maneuver, actually gives you better odds than a concussion missile, and it gives you almost comparable odds than a homing missile. Um, which gives it value. You have to telegraph your move, but um, look, I'm not jazzed about that, but there are ways of getting around it. The first way in my mind is numbers. Strength in numbers. If you can get this missile on three, maybe even four ships, you can zone really hard with this and make an entire kill zone that's so big your opponent can't fly out of it which is a cool idea. Staggering the ships in a nice sort of square formation 
doing the four speed forward and just making a zone so big your opponent has to cop at least one of these is a way of getting around it. I mean, that could work quite well. Another way of getting around this is to use other upgrades that can sort of cover you uh, where this card has weaknesses. Obviously, um, there are two major ways to avoid a missile. That's to fly out of your opponent's arc, or in the case of most missiles, which fire range two to three, you fly into range one. Now, one of the lists I've noticed going around some of my local stores um, is a Skurg bomber list, which uses cruise missiles. Um, it's three lock revenants. And the way they do what I just explained is they all also have auto blaster turrets, which is a fantastic idea, actually. I'm not gonna take credit for what these local players have discovered. Um, and I love that idea um, because the way the arc works, it's always easiest to fly into range one in order to avoid missiles. It's the easiest maneuver and the most consistent way of avoiding getting shot with missiles. And if you give your opponent a disincentive to fly into range one, it really, you're really getting the mind games working for you there. And I really like that. Again, it may, it may mean that you don't get to fire your cruise missiles, but you're getting a very cheap missile on the table, which forces your opponent to fly differently. Indeed, the auto blast turret itself only costs two points and it might shred an ace to pieces. There's always that slight risk with the auto blast turrets. Um, I rarely have success with these guys, but I think these two cards paired together makes a lot of sense. I really like that concept. If I personally was going to build a list that used the cruise missile, I want to leverage that point advantage it has over the other missiles as much as I possibly can. And using it on the Skurg Bombers is a great example of how to do that, but I've also had this other idea floating around in my head. We're going to look at the new Kirax that's coming out soon. Uh, we know what the title does. It reduces the squad point cost of every upgrade attached to it, including all your missiles. And that makes this card two points, which is even cheaper. That's really that's a really good buying cost for these cruise missiles. And it almost makes it at that point worth going, okay, it's only two points now. I don't really care if I wasted it at this point. And as I said before, a good counter to deal with the negative parts of this card is to get lots of these on the same squad. So here's what I'm thinking, you guys. Here's what I'm thinking. We already know most of what's happening with the Kirax. We only have one more pilot to reveal in the next article. We already know the generics that come in the Guns for Hire pack. That's the Cartel Marauder and the Black Sun Ace. We're going to have a look at the Black Sun Ace. We put a Vaxi title on him, so all of his, uh, the squad point cost of all of his cards is reduced by one. He costs 23 points. We can squeeze in four of this guy if we can manage to only spend two points on all the upgrades that's attached to him. And indeed, that's not difficult to do. Let's put on Cruise Missile. That's two points. Oh no, we've run out of points. Hang on a minute. The Vaxi title means all one point cards are free. So how do we capitalize on this? We put on one point or zero point upgrades. For the modification slots, we have two excellent options. Guidance Chips, an obvious choice if we're gonna use Alpha Striking Cruise Missiles and munitions fail safe. An otherwise useless card, but it's free on the Kirax. We don't have anything else to put in this slot. And if they happen to miss, we don't lose the cruise missile. Perfect. In the illicit slot, we can put any one point thing. I'm thinking either inertial dampeners or the black market slicer tools. Doesn't matter, take your pick. I think either works quite well. In the EPT slot, we have a choice of one or zero point cost EPTs, and we can take something like Deadeye, we can take a Tiny Mind Link, although that may not be an option soon with a with a with a with an alleged FAQ that may have leaked. Shh, don't tell anyone. And that's not a bad way of approaching this. Suddenly we have four cruise missiles on the table. We have four very highly maneuverable ships. Sure, we don't have the three hard maneuvers, which I think would be ideal with this card. However, we have a four straight, that's white, fantastic. We have our three banks and our three straight. So we're gonna be able to set up that alpha strike. And if we can spread them out neatly, we can alpha strike in such a way, which makes it very difficult for our opponent to counter it. Sure, they can fly into range one, but if we stagger our Kiraxes correctly, they're gonna cop some range one shots from these Kirax, and they have three attack dice. At range one, they're gonna have four attack dice. So they're not really missing out in that regard. It actually works quite well. I like this concept quite a lot. And I think when we're looking at new X-Wing cards, we really have to think. We have to craft lists around them. Don't be afraid to take one upgrade or one pilot that you love and craft an entire list around it because it really helps you learn how to capitalize on those abilities. It helps you learn how to become a better pilot and a better list builder. 
Um, and that's what I like to do. I like to take a look at one of these cards and analyze how it works and then build the ideal list for it. Um, I consider myself a very skeptical thinker. And one of my favorite TV shows about skeptical thinking is Mythbusters. And one of the things they always like to do in Mythbusters is they like to test myths, to test preconceptions about certain ideas and see if it's true or false. And if something they think is false, well, they manufacture the scenario which allows the myth to have its best shot of working. That's what I'm doing here with these upgrade cards. I'm on the fence about cruise missiles. I'm leaning towards the concept that this is a bad card. However, however, I'm trying to think of scenarios that give it its best chance of working. And the example with the Skurg bombers and the Kirax fighters, I think are probably the best way of getting it to work. And indeed, if those lists work, it proves me wrong. One of my favorite things about X-Wing is actually being proven wrong because it's about a community. It's about a discussion about how this game works. Indeed, on that note, in the comment section, guys, tell me, what would you do with cruise missiles? How would you make them work as best as possible? Do you think they're good? Do you think they're terrible? Let me know because I'm honestly curious. I'm curious about what you guys have done to make it work. I'm curious whether you guys think it's terrible. I'm curious about X-Wing upgrades in general and the best way to make them work. And that's the kind of discussion I want to garner in these videos. Anyway, guys, that's it for today. Check out Those Hairy Gamers for more gaming content. And I'll catch you in the next video. See you later.